Hello. Composing is thinking after the first idea. What comes next? What is the right thing that comes next? To the composer's opinion. I still believe that composing is somehow retrieving distant memories from oneself rather than inventing something randomly. And I speak here about inspiration, not about technique in terms of um, you learn how to fill up a page. No. It's more about projecting yourself ahead with the memories of the past. It's a very interesting uh, ephemeral moment when you improvise. <laughs> is an un unstoppable. <laughs> While, if you compose the same thematic material that you came up with, as I just did randomly and in improvised style, I will notate it in 6-8 with an upbeat of 8th note to qu um, rest, 12th notes, so la si dotted quarter tied to do sharp re la which would be a dotted quarter and then either breathing either tied to restart so la si presumably in g minor but not always through but let's say for the time being then if the melody allows you to do something more logical, which is, I think I'm going to put a dotted quarter B flat uh, tied to three eighth notes with F G sharp, F sharp G, Fa sharp Sol. And I think of the accompaniment, which in the improvisation came naturally as an arpeggio. And so in bass clef, I would do G, B, D, G, Sol, Si, Re, Sol. I never know in which language to call the notes anymore. I st studied them in solfege, but in America they call them ABC, so... For the sake of it, Sol, Si, Re, Sol. Sol, La, Do, Mi. Second degree. Turn to the tonic sol si re sol, and just on the spot, I decided that instead of reproducing the first bar accompaniment sol si re sol, when I pick it up on the fourth bar, I could just do the same accompaniment twice. But if I still think, what could I do to embellish it with sensitivity? a little appoggiatura in the accompaniment but only the second time not the very first time so the question of the uh, composition is to make choices about the right note at the right place that creates the right mood atmosphere sometimes uh, more about um, a perpetual sensation of um, um, 
sensitivity to the harmonic uh, colorization, major, minor, halfway, model, um, or, or harmonic. And those things should and are not um, conscious. I mean, you, you follow your instinct, and the instinct when you perform is what you read when you improvise is what your fancy makes you go forward to without a real mileage structure in mind though you could you could pre-decide that you're going to do it a specific shape form of bars of 8 or 16 uh, for the thematic material then it becomes predictable and all the point of improvisation is liberating is that you just navigate with pleasure as if you drive in a place that you have never been but you enjoy just discovering it without to worry getting lost because per se you don't know where you are to start with so it's just um, like listening to a foreign language that you don't understand the words but just the music of it so you disconnect yourself from the purpose in the improvisation of the arrival point the horizon line the phrases aim you could make one on sentences and you could do in improvisation. And I already added a chemiola, which is one of my weaknesses. So much I love them. Those chemiolas, if they were sweets. Which allows to have the 3 4 uh, meter inside the 6 8 of the left hand. One, two, three, one, instead of one, two, three, two, three, three, one, will become. So it's a system of variations on the cell pattern. And the more you stretch the second half of the statement, the more it becomes predictable that you basically dwell over it. And in a way it's because it's um, cradling in 6-8 and you feel like the, the arpeggio is um, the soothing aspect that doesn't distract from the melody. Now, should you think that the melody is still in the right hand and you want to have some kind of different accompaniment, you could do... with this um, <laughs> driven chords repetitively uh, which really distract from the held note of the melody as soon as you have the decay happening with the dotted quarter and if you do then or if you have something like a pizzicato imitation of the other opposite uh, st spectrum but lesser but still going around the melody under and above or you could imagine uh, having the melody speak on its own without accompaniment like a soliloquy and then you can have a second voice that is equal but not only, it could be also initiative from the lower voice. Of course, being in succession, you have impression to hear the single same melody. A combination of the two. So if they move at the same time, three or four so the more is it better 
No, the complexity is the answer to the development of the simple melodic tune, theme, leitmotif, anything you want to call it, something catchy that you can recognize. By now, this random little melody, which I repeat in the demonstration of the thought process of a composer, becomes obsessive even to you because I keep replaying it and so in real time when you perform a piece it comes once or twice perhaps three times through a different form in Chopin for instance in the same key the first ballad you don't hear it 60 times you hear it a few times but when you compose you can stay repetitively on the same cell in order to um, see or feel or search for what comes next beyond its repetitivity through embellishment or variations like I just demonstrated and you think what is the next now this is a bit stretching it forward and uh, up and if you do you can do both of course if it was a song then you could put the lyrics or you think of the lyrics and you try to fit first the words to the melody for the amount of syllables I would like to tell you something I don't know <laughs> silly right or in French je voudrais vous dire combien je vous aime for instance um, in a way then the syllables and the vowels the ones that you gather to immediately stretch or the ones that are in quick succession when you want the music to say the words in a song perhaps spoken song on the same note je voudrais je voudrais i would like and if it's an important word for instance i would love you would do a leap because this way love the word that you want to emphasize will won't come in the step motion so you value through the intervals leaps um, the degree of importance of a chosen word in the lyrics But when you don't have lyrics and it's just uh, instrumental, regardless if it's playable by other instruments than piano, you embed in the mood that you create the storytelling um, ground base and then you develop it forward, like what comes next. And um, for many centuries, the composers were taught the form before the essence because they need to basically have maps of, um, I would say, templates. <coughs> and then they fill in the group of bars and this way you can compose things that are always um, symmetrical, polite, organized, expected, at the same time curiously very creative within these restrictions compared to a free fantasia, which is what an improvisation is, where your fancy only comes in uh, when and where to do what. Of course, generally we tend to think psychologically that music brings us to a high point, the climax, after which we have to settle down or die or stop or restart uh, it could be a roller coaster system if i do then i'm going to even expand harmonically and I 
actually the pedal too. This is E minor unexpectedly. And you don't try to search how will I go back? Perhaps with that degree of G, since it's relative minor. say that the inharmonic modulation is an incredible temptation because you're so far away yet so close uh, just because your G flat in E flat is F sharp in G. So you don't have to travel much, you just sort of teleport yourself to G minor from E flat minor within a chord. Now naturally um, Affects are part of the expression. Um, sometimes too many perhaps would for sure cover the point of the story of the um, melodic line, which is like an unforgettable perfume. And it has to be as simple as recognizable, whistleable, um, whistleable meaning, yeah, you know, uh, not popular in the sense of pop song, but at least a melody that is catchy and that stays with you. In despite of the treatment, symphony quartet, solo piano piece that you heard on it. Um, I still believe very much in the fact that um, a composer, yes, retrieves distant memories from within. <laughs> the danger of too much um, studies is that one formats the raw inspiration according to the rules that one can apply to, um, in a way, if not organize it, uh, I would say um, prison it, uh, lock it in, in the know-how. And it becomes banal because it's predictable by the listener. That's not wrong by itself. Simplicity is predictable. Complexity is easy to make you lost. If I indulge in chromaticisms or border uh, atonality, and if I do this... <laughs> the treatment of this melody in this um, coating distracts me from the sweet or bittersweet feel of the melody itself. So the um, choice of the coating of the melody is um, probably more important than the melody itself in the sense that um, it allows you to um, project yourself further in as if you drive at night with very little lights in the front of your car and you sort of guess the terrain but you just see it when it comes and then you immediately write it down and you decide to go somewhere that you wouldn't have gone in the improvisation because it's in real time. You only have, if you have 6-8, you have two beats. Um, you don't have time to think, stop and start. You have to think ahead or um, to a certain extent improvising is autopilot and from time to time you change the direction if you want to go further down at certain point but don't know sure for sure how you'll get there you'll just sort of get there but when you compose and you put it on paper the first thing you do is that you look at the logic of it which prevails over the uh, irrational inspiration of it and it's good to be irrational in the inspiration because if not um, you don't want to be um, self uh, um, censoring yourself in some kind of formatting it can always come later of course there is the other system 
which is to compose without the keyboard as an immediate sound project projection monitor for your imagination. And I've noticed that when I write music um, on the table, as they say, meaning outside, of course, of the direct um, feedback of the instrument um, to test how these combinations of sounds, rhythm, pulse, harmony, phrasing, lack of all of these eventually, if it's atonal or and so on, it becomes only um, imagination product because you hear it in the echo of your knowledge of how the sounds would sound, but not the very ones that you organize. And so you can, when I write something that I didn't play, and I'm, let's say, in an airplane or in a bus somewhere where I don't have an instrument, but I have this melodic notes line in my head that obsessively need to get released <laughs> so I can think of something else. Um, uh, well, that's trivial. But in fact, uh, it is partly true, is that it becomes an inner voice that talks to you um, in music, I mean. Um, motivically, and you feel like I should do something with that because I feel like it's sketchy, it means to me, it trans I would like to. And then uh, you start thinking about how it would sound, and um, very often, let's say I, I imagine the right hand in the same G minor theme, but in s instead of a sweet um, tonal accompaniment, I would do it bitonal. And I would do an accompaniment in F sharp minor, arpeggio rather than G minor as I did before, because I find common tones with the leading tone of the F sharp. And I might find that on paper more interesting, let's say less um, evident as what the performing bring, brings me to do in the improvisation. So if I then open the keyboard as a sample to show you and I do what I did. While it's to me more interesting um, because it's less uh, predictably or expected, um, not that it's wrong to be expected in a way, that's the problem is to choose when you find that um, you need the um, obvious and when you try to escape from the obvious is the flow or the follow-up of the thought. Um, and of course if I tried as I just did compared to the so What's the purpose to dirty it up uh, instead of letting it just natural and simple um, and clean in a way? The, the dissonances of the bitonality create tensions and releases that don't release and, and dissonances that are no more dissonant in terms of waiting or, or needing a, a consonance. Um, in a way, if I continue with the idea of the uh, bitonal accompaniment, then perhaps the whole mood of the piece changes because there is something ironic in the bitonality. As if uh, the accompaniment part is oblivious to the song of the melody. And um, it doesn't try to match it harmonically. It beats its own drum, so to say. In this case, I could go staccato. And immediately I go from the tender, dolce, sweet, nostalgic mood of to something more uh, ironic or sarcastic. better the staccato uh, is a mood for a laugh or something witty and not the singing legato. It's just an example of how the written um, thought process brings you, branches you off from the in initial first melodic um, and somehow harmonic coating of the first thought. So you can surrender to just do it um, as naturally simple or you try to um, 
quote it in ways that it's uh, thought-provoking. Um, of course, you can also have the melody in the middle. Or in the bottom. Or apart in two octaves. fragmentation uh, of the melodic line and you sort of atomize the melodic line which was in step motions by doing the lips instead of and um, then you can add uneven rhythms repeated chords and uh, or uh, of course the range of the piano being so stretched between the 88 keys uh, two edges um, most of the instruments don't have that so you could use that effect on the piano to give the listener if you choose to write that uh, a sense of the vastitude of the um, exponential expansion of the thoughts that sort of like fly all over the place and in a way it's barely recognizable as a theme when it's not in step motion for the singing uh, purpose and therefore on the piano imitating the song. This is the, these are various different ways in which you can, you should perhaps explore until perhaps at the end of an um, exploration cycle of how you can stretch or modulate or determine major or minor or which mode of the melodic theme. You might come back to the simplicity of the first, but after having um, tried to develop it with uh, inspirational intuition only or with knowledgeable organization from your analytical music studies. In a way, one should um, combine so that the knowledge we have of how to organize the notes um, doesn't stifle the unpredictable appeal of the unrational organization of the notes. It doesn't mean that it's better because it's spontaneous and unrational, or it is rather more predictably better because you can even develop the thoughts um, because you have time to think and therefore you can add an appoggiatura, add a rhythmic, rhythmic difference and a different diatonal accompaniment and so forth. So then comes the point of why does it matter because I make it up in the first place? How do I know what is right or what I think should be the next um, flow of the melodic lines uh, development? I don't know, but I know when I do and I know that I know what I don't uh, like. That's why I was say, thinking about composing as I said, is a retrieving distant memories, perhaps partially remembered, and then you sort of reconstitute it. Um, it's sort of archaeology and science fiction at the same time, but in real time today. That's why it's beautiful about, um, I find, um, this ephemeral construction of the improvisation that um, vanishes as soon as is done and since it's not notated, cannot be reproduced if it had to. Of course, you can take it on dictation had you recorded it, and sometimes you realize that when you write it down from your improvisation, <coughs> um, notated, that in a way the notation, well, it could follow the unexpected uh, rhythmicity or uneven rhythms, an added eighth note here or something, so sometimes in the process of writing we normalize and sometimes we try to overcomplicate <coughs> to translate the um, impetuous moment of the improvisation in the writing. 
it all comes down to if the notation tells it all or the notation hints a few things but doesn't tell all in between the notes. To start with the tempo, the pedaling, the articulation, the um, phrasing. I believe that the composing um, process comes in the package with its own in in interpretation, so to say. Um, but in a way it's a lock, because if somebody who didn't invent the piece lays eyes, heart, soul on it, or fingers as well on the piano, they appropriate it for themselves right away. They can say, oh, I hate it, or oh, I love it, or um, what is it? I'm curious. And somehow there is an exchange between what it means to the performer who hadn't come up with it, compared to the performer who invented it and who perhaps only sees it the way he or she thought of it in the first place. But then again, the tempo is not determined fully. The mood generally might be. And I believe very much in the fact that um, it's in the eye of the beholder. I don't write for me, I write through me, so to say. <laughs> it comes throughout me, and if it touches somebody who can um, feel like they can um, express their own feelings through my notes, like I do when I play Chopin, who didn't write it for me nor for you, but for himself mostly and for his students. Um, so anyway, it becomes universal message uh, shared by all of us. Of course, then you have the educated uh, system of learning, the differences of the styles and the difference of the... All these things that, um, in a way, give you a mapping of this uh, terra incognita, of course. You don't know where you are, and uh, you have to figure out where you are, where you're going, and how you're going to go back. But um, ultimately, I still believe that composing is organizing thoughts, improvising is liberating thoughts, uh, interpretation is uh, um, adapting the thoughts of the composer through your psyche, perhaps belittle it or perhaps enhance it in ways that the composer didn't imagine because all of a sudden if I decide that I don't know the piece, I don't know the tempo, and I go... I find it very appealing like that. And the composer might say, no, 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 I thought of it as a song. And you say as an interpreter, yeah, but you didn't put the tempo marking so I can be perhaps feeling free to... It's like as if the same notes with the same melodic and harmonic um, uh, component um, appear to be in a different uh, mindset. So, of course, interpretation is not recomposing, but in a way it's rethinking it rather than rewriting it or reimagining it. It's very curious because in situations where composers die or leave a piece unfinished uh, because of other business, um, and you're called to complete it um, because it's appealing musically and you feel it, oh, what a pity that Bach didn't finish his Art of the Fugue or Mozart his Requiem or Schubert his Symphony or and so on and so on. And um, So then the music scholars who learn and study the style of the given composer, they'll make an educated reconstruction, so to say, and they might say, oh, Naumov died, uh, so what did he do after that? Um, yeah, but that's too predictable. He would have done perhaps something. And then uh, it's the randomness of it all. I did that with Glenn Gould Sonata when I was asked to do it out of the sketches of his unfinished piece, <coughs> way after his death, so no way to ask. And if I guess, um, I'm not sure he would have developed it through my guessing. So even if you want at your best, you could never come up with exactly what the composer comes with up with. As if the composers um, are iconoclasts, they don't like to follow the expected. 
And in a way, if we study them, we learn how to play or compose in their style um, by some of the gimmicks that make it immediately musically available understood that that sounds like them. But there's so much more between the notes than only the, um, let's say, uh, recognizable um, um, techniques that they use. The hemiolas in Brahms, the etc. and everybody. And inevitably, when you teach piano, as I do, you compose when you uh, grab the time between the teaching and uh, you find that uh, it's a calling, it's a need, that inevitably, um, subconsciously, even if you try to make tabula rasa, right, the clean slate, <coughs> inevitably um, music that you work on, uh, teach or rehearse or write about or whatever you deal with, it's it's there so when you write your own music you know it comes out of you but it's tainted in part with some elements of very striking um, <coughs> musical patterns from what you just are daily working on so it could become a quotation or just a um or something you want to go away of um, but we all constituted with uh, our memories and our dreams and hopes and in the real time with our exchanges with others so whatever inspires us might make us almost need to reproduce it but not fully i think it's um, mindless to think that we're going to come up with music that nobody heard ever before i think most of the music, at least in the tonal system, appear to be variations on other pieces, from other pieces of the other people, even if we don't remember them because sometimes they're forgotten and all that. And of course, being a pianist, you think through the fingers too, more than only on the table. But uh, both are possible, and I think, um, in my experience, um, the music never stops uh, I was going to say talking to me, but it's more like a, a soundtrack or a, um, yeah, soundtrack of life. And then it gets exteriorized through improvisation or notation, differently obviously, uh, filtered and organized uh, or unfiltered and just uh, spontaneous. And it's beauty in both the spontaneity and the other. You have to memorize a lot of what you think ahead in order to choose between several paths. And uh, that's when the composing becomes something like imagining, perhaps I've never done it, but I imagine it must be when people build a crossword puzzle. So they think in all directions at the same time and imagine um, how the letters would match and organize the words. So there is partly that kind of uh, excitement of organizing the chaos, but also letting the chaos happen. To me, the choice is if it's meaningful. And so if it's meaningful by being tonal or meaningful by being bitonal or atonal, then the tool is there, but the point is to be meaningful in the sense that you vehicle some kind of um, um, inner drive without the lyrics to lock it into, in, into a single storytelling. It's sort of like a, a mime telling a story um, without defining the words. And I think uh, Mademoiselle Boulanger used to speak in composing about search for la note juste, because sometimes you would say... You can <laughs> dwell over it in many ways until you find if you don't right away uh, or test to see if it holds on the test um, what is the right note why after the B flat I want to leap to the augmented second and I can question that myself while I compose it uh, either because it might remind me of some other piece or perhaps um, Yeah, it's it's a, the more I try to explain, the more I realize I run out of argumentation because 
yeah, it's a very intimate process in the in the thought process between the mind, of course, the soul, the thoughts. I mean, whatever makes us humans and vibrate on for our um, ways of just beings. What is touching is when it's meaningful to somebody else and you discover differently what it means to them to visit your uh, piece. I find that a beautiful um, chain of humanity. I mean, it happens in interpretations as well when people gather in a hall to hear a pianist play a piece they love and they discover it or rediscover it in a different way, just like a stage um, um, uh, director would present the theatre play differently, but it's still the same theatre play in the words, but not in the staging. So perhaps that would then sway to one way of looking or thinking or imagining the story meaning. Um, and here the same with the interpretation, the tempo, the articulation, the everything. All these effects matter, even if they are more or less notated or assumed to be guessed rightfully so. If you know the style, it's like learning a language and then you understand better uh, the hints in that language of what is not really written in the text unless you use translation, then you just go to the point of the story, what it means. But you don't get all the innuendos until you learn that language. And so, in a way, tonal system is a universal language that allows the psyche of the listener who doesn't know the piece to get connected to it, even without the knowledge. Of course, it doesn't function with atonal or serial music because you have to first absorb the um, alphabet in order to connect to this new language. Um, but the language by itself vehicles a storytelling, and you go back to the, I go always back to that meaningful. Pretty full, ugly full, but meaningful, or um, shocking, or expected, or um, uh, cheesy to some, uh, or perhaps um, simple to others from the same uh, piece, but from a different point of view, but meaningful. Regardless if it sounds old-fashioned or avant-garde, according to whom and when, well, of course we're all passing. But in the presence of the now, um, the performer plays in real time, for people, real time, even if the music was written before, but uh, and played by many, and it means differently to each, perhaps more or less to different people. So there is a beautiful way of thinking that music is not a locked product in a can. Uh, it's more like... Um, unleashing of human emotions to share with other humans. That's at least what I find the most uh, touching in it. And um, moving, as a matter of fact. Thank you. <laughs>